All right, and now we are live. Hello and welcome everybody to our very first Potosnack Longevity Institute Geroscience Academy Grand Rounds. I am, I am Lee Lindquist, director of the Geroscience Academy, and I am very excited to introduce our inaugural speaker, uh, Dr. Sarah Espinosa, who is professor and associate chief for research at the San Antonio, or uh, professor and associate chief for research, as well as director of the San Antonio GREC at University of Texas Health at San Antonio Bar Shop Institute. Um, she's a fascinating geriatrician, um, and I'm a super fan of her work. And today she is going to be speaking about um, the geroscience approach to the geriatric syndrome of frailty. So please welcome Dr. Espinoza. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lindquist. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. And I'm honored to be the first inaugural speaker of this series. And I hope that um, you know, this series is a successful one for you all and uh, learn a lot about geroscience. Um, so uh, as mentioned, I'm a professor at the Barshop Institute, um, which is an aging research institute in San Antonio. I'm also part of, U of course, the university, which is University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. And then our VA, uh, we have a GREC or Geriatrics Research Education Clinical Center and direct that. So um, although I, well, I spend the majority of my time doing research, I still uh, do clinical care and also engaged in um, teaching of various trainees. Um, but today, uh, what we, uh, I'd like to do is give a brief introduction to geroscience. My understanding is that this um, audience might be there might be people here who are not specifically in the aging field. So a brief overview of that. And then also uh, um, describe frailty and sort of definitions for frailty and then um, describe the clinical trial uh, I'm currently conducting for uh, metformin for frailty prevention. So um, now turning to geroscience, um, Geroscience is kind of an emerging field, probably in the last, I would say, 10 years or so, um, which is really hinges on the fact that we know that aging is the, the single most significant risk factor for many, many chronic diseases. Um, so um, this figure here just shows that um, many diseases such as heart disease, cancer, stroke, lung disease, diabetes, kidney disease, and dementia really increase with increasing age. Um, and uh, so even though we know that there's independent risk factors or other risk factors for these chronic diseases, aging is universally a major shared risk factor for many chronic diseases. And if we look, if we look at, um, one chronic disease as an example, say coronary artery disease, uh, we know what the kind of typical risk factors for heart disease is, you know, like hypertension, smoking, cholesterol, diabetes. And, um, you know, typically um, in medicine, we focus on managing these and treating these to prevent the onset of heart disease. But if we were um, to factor in the uh, impact of aging, as we do in this figure, um, you can see that when you add aging in as a risk factor and sort of adjust the others for the impact of aging, aging is by far the most significant risk factor for predicting the onset of heart disease. So this is sort of another way to look at it. Um, this is a slide I stole from John Newman, a geriatrician at UCSF, uh, where you know we can, for each individual disease, we can have many risk factors, but aging is sort of like the big one and the others are relatively smaller in comparison to aging. So um, over the last uh, couple decades, uh, there have been several landmark discoveries um, kind of elucidating um, the basic mechanisms underlying the aging process. And 
um, the details of that are, you know, really kind of, you know, beyond the scope of this talk. But um, we now know that uh, there are interventions which can um, extend lifespan in uh, rodents. Um, so the first uh, really to show that was caloric restriction. And in fact, San Antonio and the Barshop Institute was um, uh, really key in a lot of these discoveries. Um, but we also know that there are now pharmacologic agents that are known to extend lifespan. And uh, for example, rapamycin was uh, discovered in 2009, I believe. Yeah. So this is a, just a paper if you're interested in looking at sort of um, the history of these types of studies. Um, but it's just showing essentially now um, that there we, we can modify lifespan um, because we have elucidated the mechanisms of what causes aging. And then by using agents to target these mechanisms, it's possible to extend lifespan, at least in laboratory animals. So the geroscience approach really posits that but if we know the basic uh, hallmarks of aging, which some of these are shown here, and this is a common, I guess, paradigm that is now used, that we know that aging is um, characterized by dysregulation in many pathways, such as uh, mitochondrial function, metabolism, stem cells, proteostasis, stress adaptation, inflammation, epigenetic modifications, cellular senescence and mac macromolecular damage. Um, these are just some, these are always kind of, actually, it's a little bit, contro not controversial, but it seems like there's always another hallmark that um, people feel like should be added. And a big one actually, that there's an argument that should be added is the microbiome. Um, because the microbiome can actually um, affect many of these pathways, uh, again, outside the scope of the talk. But um, the thinking behind the geroscience approach is that if we have ways to modify these key hallmarks of aging, that we can, instead of taking a single disease approach as we age, we can simultaneously target aging. And by targeting aging, we we can delay the onset or prevent altogether several age-related diseases simultaneously. So um, it's more of an aging or geroscience approach as opposed to a single disease approach. Um, and we're really early in this um, line of research and um, but it's a very exciting time. So there's um, actively uh, lots of studies going on uh, using various interventions that target these hallmarks and examining their impact on health with aging. And uh, there is a translational geroscience network that is uh, funded by NIA, and there's the websites there if you're interested, but um, it'll kind of give more detail about this uh, concept and also some of the studies that are ongoing. Uh, but now I'll just turn to the um, concept of frailty or the syndrome of frailty and um, talk about how I am trying to take the geroscience approach to frailty. So um, frailty is a geriatric syndrome that I have been interested in since I was a resident, really, which uh, I'm not going to say how long ago that was, but a little while ago. Um, uh, where I guess as a medical re resident, as an internal medicine resident, I just became kind of interested in how is it um, that, you know, pretty soon after seeing a patient, I can kind of recognize that the person is frail and not going to do well um, in either in the hospital or in my clinic over time. And um, typically older adults who are frail are just highly vulnerable. Um, any little stressor will kind of put them over the edge, so to speak. For example, if they become hospitalized for whatever reason, they're often um, going to experience many uh, complications. 
And usually if they don't fully recover from whatever the acute illness is or stressor, and um, oftentimes require more um, assistance upon discharge than they needed before coming in. So, um, and then usually there's sort of a cycle, like a further decline. Um, and so more and more adverse events will occur and that ultimately leads uh, to their death. And um, at the time uh, that I was a resident, um, there was a geriatrician, I was in Rochester, New York, uh, Bill Hall, um, who uh, really encouraged me to go do my fellowship at Johns Hopkins because they were just starting, they had just published the frailty research, uh, Linda Freed. And anyway, I went there and I've done my train, I did my training with them and I've kind of been studying frailty and aspects related to frailty since then. But, um, and I'm gonna go over sort of some of the definitions, but um, there's been a lot of work in frailty over the last 20 years, um, kind of understanding what are some of, well, kind of defining what we mean by frailty. So what exactly, how do we define that syndrome of vulnerability um, and then, um, identifying really more observationally, what are some of the uh, changes that we see physiologically in older adults who are frail? Um, and uh, there's, I've listed some here, but typically they have higher levels of inflammation, insulin resistance, response, decreased response to stress, et cetera. And then I think now there's more and more work going into understanding what are sort of the more molecular um, underpinnings of what we're seeing in the phenotype. Um, there has been, again, beyond the scope of this talk, but there's uh, been a lot of work uh, gone into um, developing animal models for frailty, uh, identifying biomarkers, um, and also um, how do we measure it as I already mentioned. So um, the so I'm just going to go over probably the like the two prevailing definitions for frailty now. Um, this is a um, the first is the definition put forward by Linda Freed and um, Jeremy Walston and Ann Newman, uh, their group um, back in 2001 um, that Frailty is a clinical geriatric syndrome of poor tolerance to stress and vulnerability to decline. And people who are frail are at high risk for poor outcomes such as falls, hospitalization, disability, and death. And this uh, really landmark study was um, published in 2001, which defined frailty um, uh, using data available from the cardiovascular health study um, as the presence of three of five kind of frailty criteria, which were unintentional weight loss, self-reported exhaustion, low uh, physical activity um, like leisure time activity, um, muscle weakness measured through hand grip strength, and slow gait speed. And if you have three or more of these, you're considered frail. If you have one or two, you'd be classified as pre-frail. And then if you had none, not frail. Um, but you also can look at sort of in a dichotomous way where you're looking at three or more as frail versus everything else as non-frail. Kind of depends on, I guess, what you're doing with your analyses. But in this, um, paper that um, has been now cited probably thousands of times, they looked at um, survival over about eight years in the cardiovascular health study based on the frailty classification. And you can see that the people who are not frail have the highest survival in the solid black line at the top. Um, this next dashed line is um, the pre-frail or intermediate category. And then the worst survival is seen in the individuals classified as frail. And uh, this was very robust finding that was um, multivariate uh, survival analysis adjusted for 
you know, many of the typical potential um, things that you would think that would, you know, contribute to mortality. And um, this type of uh, uh, data has been now been kind of replicated in many, many other cohorts. Um, so that is, you know, I think until recently kind of was the prevailing definition for frailty. Um, but there is an also now uh, another definition that I think has really um, gained, I, I don't want to say popularity, but is being used and used more. And what I'm seeing in the field is that most uh, frailty researchers will kind of use both. Um, and they actually track quite well together. But the other, I guess, um, view of frailty is that frailty is a, an accumulation of deficits over time with age. Um, and this um, definition was put forward by Ken Rockwood, also a geriatrician. Um, and actually the, the um, model is based on um, information taken from a geriatric assessment, at least initially when it was first published. Um, but essentially the idea is that frailty represents an accumulation of deficits over time and health. And it can be symptoms, signs, um, impairments like vision loss, hearing loss, can be diseases, um, uh, dis disability, other types of disability. Um, and essentially uh, you sort of tally as all the deficits across a broad range of sy systems. Um, and you come up with an index of the number of deficits, you know, present over the total possible number. And uh, it's really important to do an index like this, though, that you have at least 30 to 40, um, many, many studies that you'll see who use that use this model can have, you know, up, you know, more than 50 or 60 even, um, but a, kind of a minimum is thought you need to have at least 30 and it should be a broad range of systems. Like you don't want all your deficits just in like cardiopulmonary or something, for example. Um, the, the beauty of this um, system is that um, you don't necessarily have had to directly examine or assess these patients are participants because if in the age of the electronic health record, um, you can use the health record to pull out uh, deficits or, or, you know, you can create an index using data from individuals you have not directly assessed, um, unlike the Freed model where you, it requires the grip strength and the gait speed assessment. So this has been um, come you know, used more and more, I think a lot because of that reason. And it's also, I think, um, being um, translated to the clinical setting because you could calculate this within, you know, the EMR to kind of give a score to clinicians. Um, but I still think that that's, there's a lot of work yet to be done there. Um, so those are the primary definitions. And I just wanted to kind of briefly um, start to lay the groundwork for the clinical trial that I'm now doing. Um, and kind of, I guess, try to, in a nutshell, give you, um, I guess, the rationale for that. Um, when I first came to San Antonio in 2006, I started working with the um, San Antonio Longitudinal Study of Aging. Um, which um, is led by Helen Hazuda, who's a um, sociologist and epidemiologist who started this cohort in the early 90s. And um, she um, is interested in predictors of disability in older adults. And so that was the basis for the cohort being put together. Um, but at the time there was data there to, she had grip strength and gait and basically all the, um, data necessary to, necessary to put together frailty, but had not done that yet. So that was kind of the work that um, I did, you know, with her mentorship when I first came uh, a few years ago. 
So in any event, this is a cohort of about 749 older adults in San Antonio who had a comprehensive assessment of many factors related to disability, um, including all of the variables needed to classify frailty. This cohort was unique in that um, it is by ethnic, meaning that there's about equal proportions of Mexican Americans and European Americans or non-Hispanic whites. Um, so uh, we classified frailty in this cohort uh, using the same criteria as I mentioned in the first with the FREED criteria. And you can see we found very similar findings of um, survival kind of increasing across frailty status, or sorry, decreasing across frailty status. So of course, frail being associated with worse survival in the green uh, curve there. Um, but over time, uh, as we worked with the data, um, we began to see that um, frailty is highly associated with obesity and diabetes, which um, might seem a little maybe counterintuitive because, um, you know, I just told you that unintentional weight loss is one of the criteria. Um, and so frailty, I think, initially was sort of conceptualized more like a wasting syndrome. But now, uh, you know, this data and also, which I'm going to go over in a minute, but also many, many other people have now shown that obesity is and diabetes are highly associated and predictive of future frailty. Um, so in these particular, these are just sort of cross-sectional baseline, but you can see that um, diabetes is significantly higher in the frail compared to non-frail, about 41%. Um, of the frail individuals have diabetes compared to only 18% of the non-frail. Um, waist circumference and BMI were significantly higher um, in the frail compared to the non-frail. And there's also an ethnic difference. Um, there's higher frailty in the uh, Mexican Americans compared to um, the uh, non-Hispanic white or European Americans. Um, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on that, but if you adjust that ethnic difference for um, diabetes and obesity, then that ethnic difference actually goes away. So it's primarily, I think, related to differences in diabetes and prevalence and obesity, which are worse in the Mexican American population in this cohort. Um, so we um, did some other analyses that was cross-sectional, but um, looking at the, I guess, prediction of future frailty over about um, six to seven years um, in individuals who were not frail at the baseline. And you can see that body mass index is a significant predictor of future frailty. So about 8% increased risk and frailty for each one point increase in the BMI. And also waist circumference is a significant predictor of future frailty as well um, here in this top line. Um, and then in another set of analyses, um, we were interested in looking at um, what factors predict the onset or progression of frailty, not necessarily to becoming overtly frail as in three or more criteria, but just gaining one or more frailty characteristics. So maybe going from a frailty score of zero out of those five criteria to a one. And um, diabetes was one of the biggest predictors. So if you have diabetes, you're over two times more likely to gain at least one frailty characteristic over about seven years, six and a half years in this cohort. And um, we know that um, diabetes is detrimental um, or hyperglycemia is um, detrimental for aging muscle. Um, and this is you know, a bit of an old study, but um, it just sort of illustrates that um, muscle quality is definitely impacted by diabetes. So I'll try to go through this. Uh, with you, but this is um, data from the Health ABC study. It, this is older adults, 70 years and older. And um, in the open bars, these are people who did not have diabetes, 
the hash bar are those who had diabetes less than six years. And then in the black bar, it's people who had diabetes over six years. And what we're looking at here on the y-axis is uh, muscle quality. So um, um, power or strength per kilogram unit of muscle. And you can see that the people who did not have diabetes at all or the non-diabetics have the best muscle quality. And on the left panel is showing the leg and the right panel is showing the arm, um, but it's a similar pattern for, for leg and arm and also for men and women. But essentially having uh, any type of diabetes is worse for your muscle quality and especially having diabetes for longer, so six years or more. Um, and in this same study, they also looked at um, glycemic control and kind of very similar story. Uh, the worse your glycemic control, so hemoglobin A1C over eight, uh, percent in the black bar, the worse your muscle quality. And of course, it's better if you don't have diabetes. Um, and then in the middle, diabetes with better glycemic control or, or an A1C less than 8%. Um, so, you know, diabetes, like kind of when I started this talk, is an age related disease. Um, the prevalence of diabetes goes up dramatically with age, as we see here. Um, these are um, percent of the total population in the US who are diagnosed or undiagnosed with diabetes. And um, you can see um, kind of on the right side of the panel here, starting in middle age, 45 to 64, the prevalence of diabetes diabetes diagnosed is about 13%. And then in the 65 to 74, that kind of goes up to close to 20%. And then over 75, you're a little bit more on that, but the, I, the undiagnosed diabetes actually increases to about 15%. And um, that also, so being kind of undiagnosed or even pre-diabetic, um, as I'm gonna show you in a moment, um, is not great for how well you, we age. Um, and it's a big um, problem um, with uh, obesity uh, epidemic in our um, older adults and in the US in general. Um, and then this is another study um, using N. Haynes data that just showed that um, the HOMA IR, which is a measure of insulin resi resistance, um, was associated with decline in gait speed um, over time. So um, they, what they did here is look at quartiles of insulin resistance in men only in this particular study. Um, and they looked at um, the, the gait speed um, meters per second. And so for people who had the highest level of HOMA IR, which is the most insulin resistant, then their gait speed was the, the lowest. And also similarly um, was found that there was a worsening change in lean mass in muscle by these quartiles of insulin resistance. So the quartile four or the worst insulin resistant was associated with the greatest decline in lean mass over time. Um, so um, where I guess where I'm going with this is that, you know, uh, hyperglycemia, insulin resistance is uh, detrimental to aging muscle. Um, and there may be the potential and that it's very common so there might be the potential to use uh, medications like insulin sensitizers to um, improve this. So this was a kind of secondary data analysis um, looking at older adults, um, well, actually men only, um, who had different classes of glycemia from normal to impaired fasting glucose to untreated diabetes, and treated diabetes. And then in the treated diabetes group, they looked at people who um, were not on medications that are considered insulin sensitizers. Um, 
or they were on medications that are not insulin sensitizers versus medications that are insulin sensitizers like metformin or TZDs. Um, and what they found, um, this was in the osteoporotic fractures in men study, also known as the Mr. Oz study. Um, they found that people who, let's go to the right, the far right, people who had diabetes who were treated with insulin sensitizers, um, sorry, without insulin sensitizers had the most decline in lean mass over time, over about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. People with diabetes, but had insulin sensitizer treatment like metformin or TZD had a de decrease, they still had decline, but not as bad. So about 1.8% uh, decline. Um, and um, untreated diabetes was just as bad as diabetes being treated without insulin sensitizers. So you can just um, you know see that there. But essentially, uh, it just gives some at least observational ev evidence that insulin sensitizers, like metformin um, or others, may uh, be beneficial to preserve lean mass over time. Um, now. Lean mass, though, it doesn't necessarily correlate to strength. So, um, uh, and this is observational, so, you know, not definitive evidence. Um, I'm going to just skip this slide in the interest of time because I feel like we go till one, right? And I'm kind of running out of time here. So, obesity. Um, and this is sort of the conceptual model for the clinical trial that I'm doing now, which is that, and I didn't go into any of this data, but many, many show, studies show that um, frailty is associated with high levels of inflammation, like IL-6, C-reactive protein, and other kind of inflammatory biomarkers. And it's also associated with insulin resistance. Um, and these are kind of big predictors of future frailty. So, um, the concept behind the trial is that in a certain subset of older adults who are um, kind of glucose intolerant, pre-diabetic, uh, not yet diabetic, using metformin could be a way to prevent the onset of frailty. So there is some evidence from um, animal studies that metformin extends lifespan in C. elegans, um, nematodes, and rodents, and also that it improves um, physical function like exercise tolerance and locomotor activity. And then there's a lot of uh, extensive, actually, observational studies in humans suggesting that metformin might be beneficial for uh, cancer prevention, cardiovascular disease, dementia, and also um, mortality and frailty. And um, I won't go into that in great detail, but this is just some of the other studies that have shown this, including um, some work that I did with a really ta talented biostatistician here, um, but I don't think I have a lot of time to go into that because I wanna leave time if there are questions. But there is, just suffice it to say, extensive data in animals supporting metformin as a aging target um, agent, um, and also observational data supporting that it may be beneficial for aging. Um, so there's a lot of interest in metformin for um, improving uh, health span with age. Um, so uh, this is the basis of the clinical trial that I'm in the midst of doing now. Um, this study was initially supported by our Pepper Center as a pilot study and now is supported by an R01. Um, and essentially we are, um, well, we have finished enrollment, but we have randomized about 145 older adults who have prediabetes based on an oral glucose tolerance test. So they, have, they are oral glu glucose intolerant. And then we uh, randomized them to um, metformin versus placebo. Metformin is the maximum tolerated dose up to 2000 milligrams per day. And we're using um, the immediate release form. And they are treated for two years and followed for two years. And we are 
at the baseline collecting um, various measures of course frailty, which is the primary outcome, but also uh, doing safety labs at least every three months. Um, we're measuring frailty every six months. We repeat the oral glucose tolerance test every six months. Um, and then we actually, this is a very translational trial where we are doing muscle biopsies at the baseline and then every 12 months. So we have three time points on that, as well as um, DEXA to look at body composition. And then we also have insulin clamp to look at insulin sensitivity, which is the gold standard for insulin sensitivity. Um, so we, again, we're in the midst of the trial, um, I'm blinded. <laughs> the patients are blinded. So I have, sadly don't have any results to share. Um, but we are on the tail end. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, we're going to have a lot of um, data soon, um, uh, probably in the next year to two years. The study will be going on for probably the next year. And then we will, I guess we will have some, maybe some answers to whether metformin uh, might be helpful for frailty prevention. But this is just um, a kind of a snapshot of the type of um, data that we're collecting. And we're primarily, um, of course, focused on frailty as the primary outcome, but we also have many secondary outcomes uh, like physical function, six minute walk, um, inflammatory markers, tissue inflammation in the muscle, insulin signaling in the muscle, um, body composition, and then glucose um, sensitivity or, or glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity. Um, and then sort of as a, I guess, ancillary study to this, um, we are also looking, so metformin, although some of it, uh, the mechanism is known, uh, there, there's a lot of, uh, the full mechanism of action of metformin is not totally elucidated. And there's a lot of data suggesting that metformin targets many of these hallmarks of aging. So uh, Nick Moosey and I uh, were funded for another study to look at uh, the effect of metformin versus placebo on many of these other um, pathways uh, using specimens from the primary trial. So uh, the primary trial is primarily focused on insulin sensitivity, AMPK activation and inflammation. Um, and then in the ancillary study, we added uh, measures of cellular senescence, mitochondrial function, and also epigenetic modifications. And so the mitochondrial function will, we have been doing alongside with the muscle biopsies and we are doing Ouroboros assays for uh, mitochondrial respiration. So, um, you know, I think I had a whole little thing about um, whether frailty is a, is a useful outcome in clinical trials or not. Uh, just suffice it to say, I think that this study that I'm doing is one of the few trials to use frailty as an outcome in clinical trials. Um, I just would, I guess I would just say that, you know, the geroscience approach is fairly novel and we don't really know like what is the best outcome. Um, it probably will vary, of course, based on the particular clinical trial or in the agent that's being tested. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in the field there. And um, I am just gonna fast forward, sorry, I, I guess I'm talking too much. Um, I just wanted to kind of, start to wrap it up and just um, summarize by saying that um, insulin resistance is a risk factor for frailty and metformin could be a potential treatment for frailty um, and we're conducting the clinical trial. But I also wanted to put a plug in for our PEPPER Center, uh, which focuses on um, geroscience guided clinical trials. And this is just a list of some of the studies that we are doing um, at the, at the Bar Shop Institute. And if you're interested in um, you know, partnering or collaboration, uh, feel free to reach out to me. 
Okay, so I will go ahead and stop there and I'd be happy to take any questions. And I just want to thank all the people that have uh, helped me with this work and um, also the funding. No, thank you so much. That was an awesome talk, Dr. Espinosa. Oh, thank you. Thumbs up. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think from my angle, I, I've seen a lot of people try to study frailty, um, but the measurement can be so nebulous sometimes, and sometimes it's a little hard to do, you know, whether it's the, you know, walking or the hand grip. Um, have you seen a very pared down version of doing frailty assessments? Because I know most of the ones that we do in our research is pretty extensive. Yes. Uh, but just for translating it into EMRs and, and so forth. Yeah, so the the AGS actually, or the American Geriatric Society, um, came out for came out with like a one pager. It was like geriatric assessment in the clinic, and they tried to kind of simplify the freed uh, methodology. Um, so that's one way, but it still does require you know measuring gait and grip. So I know that that I mean, as a clinician myself who has my own <laughs> Uh, clinic as well. I I know that that may not be practical for everybody. Um, there is a questionnaire called the Frail Scale. Um, it's actually a questionnaire that's based on those five criteria, but it's you know you you don't directly measure them. You ask, and I'm pretty sure that that's been validated. And actually, um, in the hospital um, on the Jerry Trauma Service I'm working on. Uh, it is the, we use that because um, we're not directly measuring it in the patients. And it has been shown to predict kind of discharge, like discharge location in those patients. So I think if you're looking for kind of um, a little bit more, I guess, feasible to use in clinical practice, I think that that's one for sure. Oh, and then lastly, I'll just say uh, that Johns Hopkins does have a website where you can go and kind of input information and it will kind of give you a frailty score. No, awesome. I think more people need to study frailty as an outcome because it's just one of these things that we know so much of it happens with geriatrics. So I'm glad to see that you're working on it. Um, and let me see if there's any other questions. I don't know if Dr. Vaughn had a question um, or not. I saw something blurb up. Um, but I want to just say thank you so much uh, for your awesome presentation. And oh. Our, um, oh, there is a question. Hold on one second. Okay, great. Hi, can I? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, very great talk. This is Doug Vaughn. A uh, couple things. Uh, first, we uh, my group studies a unique, uh, an interesting Amish population in northeastern Indiana. Uh, that harbors a null mutation in the gene that codes for PI-1. It's probably the most important member of the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. And oh. the carriers of this genetic variant are protected from aging in a variety of different dimensions. So we have a, we have a satellite laboratory over there where we bring in Amish uh, on a daily basis and put them through a series of exercises to test their or determine their molecular and physiological age. And, you know, we include some measures around frailty, frailty, including grip strength and walking speed. Do you think that's an, an adequate, or do you think those are the two that we should do routinely, or are there other things that we should add to that? Yeah, I think that that is, I, 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 I think those are probably the key ones um, that will really get at sort of the um, underlying like sarcopenia and muscle. I assume you you might also be measuring kind of body weight. Yeah, we, we yeah of course we yeah we're we're uh, we're pretty comprehensive in terms of measuring body body weight BMI uh, yeah fasting insulin and glucose all all those, all those other kinds of things ca cardiovascular parameters etc. Yeah, I think that that's probably, um, I think one time I kind of explored in the salsa cohort, like which are the ones that are, the, the frailty characteristics that are kind of more associated with mortality. Uh -huh. And I never, I haven't published this, but 
off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure it was the grip strength and the gait speed. And we know gait speed in particular. Um, there's a kind of a paper by Stephanie Studensky in like 2011 that showed that gait speed highly correlated with mortality. So yeah, I think you're doing it. That, that, that should be good. <laughs> I had another question related to your, your points about insulin resistance and, and potentially a skeletal muscle blood flow. You know, uh, there are ways of measuring uh, or quantifying glucose uptake in tissues that are relatively non-invasive, including PET scans. Have, have you ever, ever done PET scans in adults with frailty to see if they have, or and with insulin resistance, looking at glucose uptake in their skeletal muscle and the potential impact of a drug like metformin in improving glucose uptake in skeletal muscle? Yeah, that is a really good question and uh, idea. And no, I have not. And I don't know if anyone has actually. Um, we are in the muscle that we, you know, when we do the muscle biopsy, we mm -hmm. are, because DEXA is not maybe the best measure. It's not the same question, but of uh, lean versus fat mass, we are taking some and fixing it. So we can mm -hmm. kind of look at the cross-sectional area of the muscle fibers. Mm -hmm. um, but PET scan, we have not done, but that's a good, that's a good idea. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> well, it's not, it's, it's not cheap, but at least it's non-invasive. Yeah, and that's can, true. And you can do it on somebody no, a number of times. Obviously people with cancer get it done all the time. You know? That's true. Yeah. 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 That was really a great talk. Thanks for being oh. our first speaker for our seminar series for our our longevity institute here at Northwestern. It's terrific. Oh, no problem. Thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed it. Thank I'm you sorry very I, much. I, sorry, I, I rushed through some of the slides at the end there. <laughs> you did great. You did great. And thank you everyone for attending. Have a great afternoon. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>